this evening really needs no introduction. I, I won't say how old he, how old he is. Uh, I'll let him do that. His experience is tremendous, and from our dinner this evening, his uh, mental uh, acuity is, is wonderful. His outlook on the future is, is wonderful. One story I would like to tell that uh, when I call him and ask him if he would speak, uh, his comment was, geez, what do I have to tell? <laughs> and I said, well, just kind of over the phone, tell me some of the things that happened to you uh, in World War II. You were on Admiral Hall's staff. And you had a lot of exposure and experiences. And he started ticking off, well, I can talk about that. Well, I can talk about that, talk about this. And pretty soon he said, have you got two evenings for me? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we're very, very happy to have him. And uh, I, I don't want to be accused of having all Army or Air Force uh, subjects. Uh, tonight uh, we'll be talking about the Navy. Governor Stassen. First time that I've been introduced with a false statement. <laughs> I'm sure you all know that, you all know that uh, I didn't say if you got two evenings. <laughs> Matter of fact, I still don't know just how he talked me into it six months ago because literally I never have talked about Admiral Halsey in the Navy. I've always been uh, too busy on things of the future rather than go back over those things. And of course, I guess I got a little more of a historic turn of mind about six months ago when he called me because I started in by special request to write a book about the first three years of President Eisenhower up to the time of the Geneva summit meeting in 1955. But I, of course, feel that he was a president that literally changed the world, especially those three intense years. And I was very pleased to see here tonight one of the young researchers from the University of Minnesota who's helped dig up and follow up on some of those things. Uh, Connie Harris is here somewhere tonight. I was pleased to see that she uh, came around. Uh, apparently her interest in history is wider than her courses over at the university. In uh, responding to your invitation, or the invitation of Don, I should also say that I'll tell you the true story of when he called me. He said we have a round table talking about World War II, and uh, 15 or 20 people gather around a table, and we have an interesting discussion about World War II, and we'd like you to sit at the table and talk with us. And of course, a little later, he said, well, you're going to have to stand up. You can't sit. And it's, you're going to have a little more than 15 or 20 people. So I'm responding, and I'll endeavor to conform to the pattern. I think perhaps I should begin with attempting to answer the most penetrating question that I've ever had in relationship to my service. A fellow said to me, how did it ever happen that a farm boy from Minnesota, as far away as you can get from both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, who never had command of anything bigger than a rowboat, got on the staff of Admiral Halsey? Well, literally, I never knew the answer until just a few years ago when I did get a bit of time and started to look at some of the Navy history books. And this is apparently the way it happened. Of course, when Pearl Harbor hit, I was in my second term as governor of Minnesota. But I was not only a very young governor, I was also a young reserve officer. And when Pearl Harbor hit, Inside of me, there was only one thing I could and should do, and that is go on active duty. And I was not only then governor of Minnesota, I was chairman of the National Governors and been working and cooperating on the matter of the 
preparations for mobilization and so forth. And I told uh, Secretary Stimson and Secretary Knox that I had decided that I would resign as governor and turn it over to the lieutenant governor and go on active duty. Well, shortly after I went on active duty, I was given orders to report down to the South Pacific to Admiral Halsey. And I didn't know just how that happened, although of course at the time the legend was that if you had wanted duty in the Atlantic, you should ask for duty in the Pacific. <laughs> and I had simply said, I'll serve wherever you feel you want me to serve. So I flew down to the South Pacific and made my regular report to Admiral Halsey, who was then down in, at the base in Noumea, New Caledonia. And he looked up at me and he said, are you here to work? I said, yes, Admiral. He said, that's all I want to know today. That was my introduction to Admiral Halsey. So I went back out and they say, I read in the history books later, that Secretary Knox and Secretary Stimson, when they knew I was going to come on active duty, said to each other, uh, the Joint Chiefs, well, we don't think he knows very much about the Navy, but if he's been governor for three terms, he must know something about administration. And they were talking over then the fact that down in the South Pacific, they had a command then under Admiral Halsey, who was under Admiral Nimitz at Pearl Harbor, bordering on a command under General MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific, who was then under the Joint Chiefs in Washington. And they had Australian and New Zealand forces also involved in the area. And they thought they had a pretty complicated administrative picture, and so they didn't know how it would be handled or what would happen but they decided to send a young governor down to active duty, down to Admiral Halsey. As I say, I just learned that background of how they happened to send me down there in the naval history books a few years ago. Well, after he said, that's all I want today, or something of that kind, closed off that initial reporting interview in his brusque manner, I went back out and one of the officers said, there's an extra bunk up at the Admiral's house, up here on the hill, and uh, I understand that you're supposed to go up and take that bunk. So the Marine and the car that brought me down from the airport took me up with my bag up the hill and showed me that room, and the, the Filipino in charge of the mess said, we serve breakfast tomorrow morning at 6.30. We serve dinner tomorrow night at 7. We don't serve any lunch. So that was my introduction. And then some of the other officers came along and they said, if you care to get out on the porch around 6 or 6.30, the Admiral sometimes stops there before we go in at 7 o'clock sharp for dinner. I did that, and in the course of a sort of a kidding and rambling conversation, the Admiral suddenly shot a question at me, how come you're way down here in the South Pacific? I said, because I received some orders to report to you, sir. There was a little silence and we went on to other banter and then a couple other serious questions. And the next day, some of the other officers there said, well, you passed the first test. I said, what do you mean? Well, he says, if somebody reports here and he asks them that question, how come you're down here? And if they say, because we thought you were a great admiral and we wanted to serve under you or something like that, he usually sends them back to some other command. <laughs> he doesn't like that kind of language. So he said, you passed the first test. Of course, I passed it simply by being accurate in my response. And a few days later, after I was getting a little acquainted with the command down there, he called me in. He said, Commander, I was then a lieutenant commander. They decided when they sent me down there that I should have that rank in order to fit into the staff. He said, uh, administration is now being handled in my command 
by a very good Air Force officer, Air, Navy Air officer, and uh, he's a regular Navy. He's too competent to be assigned to administration. So he said, I'm going to move him over to Air Operations because the Air Operations officer is ill and is going to be sent back to the United States. So you step into administration. I said, yes, Admiral. And of course, a short time later, he did appoint me as Assistant Chief of Staff for Administration, and that's where I served in the rest of the war. Then, after a little bit, I'm going to skip over things and I'm going to zero in on one of the real major events of that war in the Pacific from the standpoint of any of the commands. And then, as I say, open up the maximum of time for such questions that you may wish to ask, and I will endeavor to respond to them. And of course, I do know that if I get off the beam and too inaccurate in my responses, we have Dr. Deutsch here, one of the great historians, who will straighten me out <laughs> on the mistakes that I made. Well, Admiral, after I was with Admiral Halsey a few weeks, he said, we've got some operations that sort of bridge over into the Southwest Pacific. And he said, uh, I've never met General MacArthur, so I want to go over and pay my respects, and we're going to talk about the future operations. And he said, I'd like you to come along, but sit in the back of the room and don't say a damn word. <laughs> but when we come back, I want to see what you think of the situation. And that was my first assignment directly with the Admiral, apart from the matter general uh, administrative work for the command. So seven of us flew over to Brisbane in Australia and met at General MacArthur and six of his officers. And we had very intensive sessions about the two commands and the way in which they ought to work together when they go over the line between what we call the Nimitz zone to the MacArthur zone and so forth. And, uh, and of course, they talked a lot about that interrelationship and about how you ought to handle the Australian, Australian forces and the New Zealand forces and so forth, and about different circumstances. And we had these intelligence briefings by the intelligence officers of both commands who gave the whole picture of what they knew about the locations and positions of the Japanese and so forth. And I often wish that I had a sound motion picture record of that conference because MacArthur would get up and stride up and down, direct, stately, <coughs> stem of his pipe would point to places on the map and he'd recall certain things that the intelligence officers had missed and he'd speak in flowing, beautiful English uh, with concepts of how to envelop this plank and how to hit the force here. And then in the middle of it, as Admiral Halsey was sitting there in the front, sort of hunched down and that old chin of his sticking out and those bushy eyebrows almost covering his eyes. And suddenly he said, but God damn it, Mac, why don't we hit the bastards over here? <laughs> he pointed to another place in the map. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a terrific rapport between the two of them. Because the fact that his first comment was very direct and a matter of a way of attacking and that, of course, was one of the great characteristics of his thinking of Admiral Halsey. Well, then, from that time on, when we got back to our headquarters in Brisbane, Admiral called me in and said, what do you think? I said, well, I said, he's a brilliant general. He said, I agree. He said, I think he respects you, and I think you'll get along all right. I agree. At that time, up to that time, I knew, of course, from the top secret traffic, the Joint Chiefs were considering whether they go directly up toward Japan, bypassing the Philippines, or whether they go in first and take the Philippines back from the Japanese. And then there was a question of whether you put a base into Formosa, and just how do you approach the mainland of Japan for victory in the war. And of course at that stage we were down in the 
extreme southern air area of South Pacific and Southwest Pacific. The thinking of being here, and as I say, because I should say and emphasize, I haven't really had the time to review any of my old records or to try to read up. I'm just going to talk to you out of such memory as I have, so don't be too rough on me. But I did ask my staff to prepare a little bit of a map which will help me in talking and perhaps you in following it. So we've got, naturally, I don't have a Navy staff anymore. I just have a very amateur staff. But uh, we've got put together a kind of a map. I think maybe, Don, you better help me pull this over a little close. Pull the easel over a little closer and it'll help. You can't see it back in the back. You can come up and look it over more later on. But this was about as big an enlargement as we could put together at this time and quickly try to do something or tonight. But we, of course, he was way down here in Brisbane. We were over here off this map in Numea, New Caledonia at that point early in the war. When, and what, what I've indicated here is what the situation was in October 1944, which was quite a while later than the conference that we had, the opening conference the first time that Halsey and MacArthur uh, talked together. It was after that conference that, that he moved on up into Hollandia, Biak, and Moratai, and established air bases in here. And we went around the Japanese at Rabul over to Manus Islands. And of course, we went around to Ulithi, and we came across up here and took the Saipan and Guam and Tinium and left them here at truck. And of course, this map right away, and this discussion indicates one of the really great principles that Admiral Halsey very early developed. He went through the Tarawa operation with the terrible loss of life in trying to dig the Japanese out of those rocky places on Tarawa. And he made up his mind at that time, he said, let's leave them to rot on those islands and go around them. He said we should keep island hopping where they're not until we get to, Jap to Japan, and then, of course, we'll have to kill them all. That's the way he approached it in his very blunt language. And that matter of bypassing and going around, one of the first big things, of course, they had a tremendous base down here at Rabul, and they had about 100,000 men dug in there. We went around them to Green Island, Manus Island, and of course where the CBs immediately built <coughs> the moment we took command of, the, of an island that was substantially. And then they did a similar thing in Alandia. There were still Japanese here in the jungles, in fact, when the war was over. And then an air base here at Biak, and an air base established Moratai. And that was that early stage of the discussion. I said, Admiral, in my judgment, MacArthur will never agree to bypass the Philippines. I said, I watched him, I listened, I thought, and I know there's a lot of this talk about going right up this way. The Joint Chiefs have some other thoughts about going to Formosa and then up to Japan. But I said, for one thing, I'm very sure that he will never agree to bypass the Philippines. Secondly, I'm sure that President Roosevelt will never overrule him, regardless of any Joint Chiefs of Staff studies. He said he will want to go through the Philippines, and the President, as Commander-in-Chief, will never overrule him. The Admiral said, uh, that's very interesting. He says, how do you reach that conclusion? I said, well, you asked me to just sit and listen and look. And I said, I've been doing a fair amount of that in politics, and that's the way I size it up. And uh, he also said, well, 
you're not even a Democrat, are you? He said, well, how do you size up Roosevelt that way? I said, well, that's just a part of what I did. <laughs> well, time went on, and we made these kind of advances. And then we came to the point where the Admiral, of course, was told, as he really got the South Pacific down here, a matter of Guadalcanal and Bougainville, and got that area pretty well cleaned up and got Rabul cut off, sort of, and circled by getting up in here with the CBs establishing some fine air bases in a hurry. So then they told the Admiral that when Admiral Spruance would need some relief, he was then in command of the fleet up after Midway and up that way. He said, when that happens, you're going to go out and take command of the combat fleet. So the Admiral got us together. He used to have seven officers, the seven senior officers on his group that had a sort of a special consulting group. And I was the only reserve officer among them, and the junior, of course. But he talked it over, and he said, if I'm supposed to take command of the fleet, he said, I want three of you. He said, uh, Doug Moulton, he just said Doug, of course, I'd like you, and I'd like Jack Horner and Harold to go up and join Spruance for the operation that's coming up on taking Saipan and Guam and study the situation and see what we need when we take command of the fleet. So the three of us, Doug Moulton, one of the greatest air operations officer that there was in the whole war, and later became a vice president of U.S. Steel after, after the war was over, Jack Horner, a terrific officer, and me tagging along, went out to join Spruance for the amphibious landing and taking over of Guam and Tinium and Saipan. That was about in June of 44. And that's, of course, the time when the Japanese Navy came out here and they had those heavy attacks of uh, Navy air from the Japanese and our flyers went up to meet them and sometimes called the Turkey Shoot and various things. It's also the place where uh, Admiral Spruance, because they'd gone out so far and the fleet had been pulled back to cl close in the defense of the um, landings and so forth. It got dark and a lot of the flyers couldn't find their way back to the carriers. But that was that dramatic moment where in the dark, in spite of all the question of submarines and so forth, Admiral Spoons gave the signal, turn on the lights. So suddenly at night the whole carrier fleet out there turned on their lights and the pilots who were circling around and couldn't find their way in a lot of them found their way then down to their carriers. Some still had a land in the Drake, and uh, many of those were picked up, but of course too many of them were really lost out there. But that was that <coughs> operation. Coming back from there, Doug Moulton and Jack Horner and I talked it over a great deal. We reached the conclusion, unanimous, that the way the flag area, the Admiral's area of those ships was constructed. The, there was no chance of Admiral Spruance having the kind of information that he ought to have right in front of him. And furthermore, that in the way the ships were constructed, if the Admiral was going from his flag plot and command area down to his cabin, he had to go outside and down a ladder and back into his cabin on the floor below of the level below, and said, that doesn't make sense. So as we talked it over, flying back from out there and back down to the South Pacific, we came up with a detailed plan. And the plan was that we would take the flag plot area and the radio area up on that command level, open them up, take out the bulkhead in between, and make that one big command and plot room. And that then we talked to Ham Dow, who was our brilliant communications officer, and he said, I go with it. The only thing we need up there is the TBS, the talking radio, 
because I want to just build up the kind of radio installation that I want down in the regular radio room of the New Jersey. That was going to be our battleship, our modern command ship. And we came up with the idea that from the corner of that flag plot up there, there should be a hole cut through, which then took directly down to the Admiral's cabin, just a few feet from his bunk in his cabin, and then we'd put in a light aluminum ladder, which would go up to the ceiling and you could pull it down, and then the Admiral could go up and down from the command area down into his cabin so quick and be called back up and up and down and so forth because of course we knew at that time as you're operating out there you never know at what time of day or night bogies are approaching or the submarines are sighted or whatever happens and with that situation we had our complete plan with Hamdow's revisions from a communication standpoint we laid it before Admiral Halsey and talked it over for a day and the Admiral finally said uh, with a few of his own modifications your plan is approved and then he said uh, Harold, uh, Doug and Jack are completely tied up with these operations so you go up to Pearl Harbor to the Navy yard up there and you get the New Jersey prepared for my command on the basis of the plan which I've approved. I said, yes, Admiral. And just as I was starting out the door, he said, and by the way, he says, don't let anybody with less than four stars stop you from getting that put into effect. <laughs> and I looked at him and he had a big grin, but he'd said it, and I started out to Pearl Harbor. And of course, from the South Pacific up there was quite a flight. I got up to the Navy Yard, and they called a big conference. It's to have been nine or ten of the Navy Yard, rear admirals, vice admirals, conferring. And I had, of course, it brought up with me about ten copies of the plan we had worked out. And I explained it and gave them all copies. Then they started around the table saying, well, of course, we all know you, you can't cut a hole in that deck. That's against Navy regulations. It's just outrageous because if a bomb comes right down and down that hole, well, it'll wipe out the whole cabin down below and so forth. There's just no way that can be done. And another admiral said that bulkhead between the flag plot and the radio room is absolutely essential and uh, there ought to be enough room for a plot and the rest of it. And they went around the table and they said, uh, Commander, we'll go review this more and then tomorrow morning we'll confer with you as to just what we'll do about fixing the New Jersey or uh, putting the New Jersey through. I said, well, Admiral, the only problem is that Admiral Halsey told me not to let anybody with less than four stars change his plan. There was a ghastly silence in the room. <laughs> they were looking up and down at each other. Of course, here I, was I a lieutenant commander. And I said it with a smile, but I said it in a way they knew I meant it. And uh, finally one of them said, well, you come in tomorrow morning. So I came in tomorrow morning, the next morning, and they said, we've been communicating with Washington, and uh, we think we decided that we're going to do it the way Admiral Halsey wants it. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Admiral Halsey arrived, some few days later, to take command and get on board the New Jersey, he looked through the thing and he went up and down that aluminum ladder and he looked at we had a, a plot complete length of the two what would had it been two rooms on one side we had a tremendous plexiglass set up for air and we had the boys training to be behind it and put the boogies on it so you could read it from the other side so you could stand in the middle of that room and for one thing, you had this tremendous flag plot, and we had the whole thing plotted 
<coughs> way down here in Singapore and Borneo and all the way up to northern Japan. That whole strip was on our plot and we had a long plot to be able to do it. And we had a marvelous uh, chiefs and sailors, very intelligent young fellows who were following all the intelligence reports and locating where the Japanese fleets were and where our submarines were and so forth, and putting down on there everything that was happening. And we drilled them and took a, a tremendous preparation. I should have mentioned, too, that in this process also, the Admiral added to my official duties to be in charge of Combat Information Center. So that's what I went through the rest of the wars. Assistant Chief of Staff for Administration and Officer in Charge of Combat Information Center. So then we moved on up the war. And as we came in and having in mind that the matter that Shirley MacArthur was going to go, want to go into the Philippines, that we had to really knock out all the Japanese air in the Philippines. And as we attacked time after time and kept our records, we found and we know that the Japanese had established a whole network of airfields every so few hundred miles from Japan itself down and over Formosa on the one hand and another run down over here all the way down to Saigon, all the way down through the Philippines, all the way down to Brunei. Those were two complete networks of airfields under which they could shuttle their combat planes up and down those fields in either direction at any time. And that was one of the important air factors of information that we clued in on. The other thing we found was that as we attacked the airfields, we tried to get them at, at dawn so that they would still be on the ground, because we, of course, very early found that we could knock out more planes with less losses on our part if we could catch them on the ground than if we had to knock them down out of the air. And as that information developed, we got down in the southern area of the Philippines, and of course at this time we had four carrier task groups functioning, and we'd have one going back to Ulithi to refuel and get a little few days of rest, and three out on the line at any given time. And one of our pilots had an engine failure one day and landed in Leyte. And in most of these areas at that time, we had uh, these coastal watchers who were really our scouts, and uh, they also had radar hookups to be able to relay messages from what they were seeing on out. And they'd watch, of course, designated to watch for ships and watch for any movements and so forth. Well, as this pilot had to make a forced landing one day, why one of our scouts got a hold of him right away and took him out into the jungle, and, and he told him that Leyte was really undefended, with practically nobody there on the whole of Leyte. And Leyte, this little island area that has a bridge over to Samar, and uh, the sketched out for this pilot just where the few little units were and what was happening on the other side of that bridge and so forth. And the pilot came back to his carrier then as he they brought him out and we had of course the way of sending in to the edge of the uh, Philippines for him and picking him up and bringing him back. <coughs> that regular rescue service was highly organized. But when he got back to his carrier, he began to send the reports over of what he'd seen <coughs> and then what he'd heard. And it was so significant, we had him transferred over to the New Jersey, the flagship. And the Admiral and the Chief of Staff and the Air Operations Officer Moulton talked to him in depth and looked at the pictures they had. We did a lot of photography on every attack. And we're thinking a lot about it. The plan at that time was that General MacArthur, in his first move, 
was going to land down here in Mindanao. And we also were then to land and take over Yap and Peleliu. And we listened to these reports and looked over our photography. Uh, Admiral Halsey said, Jesus, these plans ought to be changed. And he said, we ought to do something about it. And say, later on, he, uh, coming to a, one of the historic cables, but later on he was asked after the war, and it's, this is in the history books, he said, is it true that Admiral Kearney and Commander Stassen recommended to you to send that message to the Joint Chiefs? He said, recommended hell. Stassen's the only junior officer that ever told me it was my duty to send the telegram. <laughs> because that, in a way, is what I said. I said, Admiral, nobody in the whole world, anywhere, knows what you now know about this lady area. And nobody knows as accurately the way they're prepared to defend Yap and Peleliu, the way they're dug in, and the kind of casualties you take in those places. So, very well, he said, draft a message. And uh, Admiral Kearney, Mick we call him, a great Irishman, and I drafted the message back to Nimitz, and from him it went on up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and down to MacArthur. And they were having a conference at the summit up in Ottawa. Uh, Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt and so forth, and the Joint Chiefs were up there. And we didn't know at the time, of course, but that cable, as it went on up its way, came up to them at Ottawa. you find this in the history books. And they got it just before they were supposed to go into dinner. The dinner was delayed by the Joint Chiefs held a conference up there in a side room at Ottawa. And of course, the, but in the meantime, Nimitz came in and backed what Halsey'd recommended. MacArthur came in and backed it. And the Joint Chiefs decided to take it up with President Roosevelt, recommended it to him, and the order came back, change the whole plan, land in the Philippines at Leyte, not in Mindanao, and do it on the 20th of October, 1944. They said, Yap is canceled and those forces can be used. They said, it's too late to change Peleliu. And of course, that was one of our sad experiences. We lost an awful lot of good men on that godforsaken atoll of Peleliu, digging them out of those rocks. They wouldn't change Peleliu, but they changed Yap, and they shifted. So then that led to what turned out to be one of the great crucial points of the war. Because <laughs> with a quick change around, the landing force, the amphibious forces, were redirected to come in and land in right here where this blue is. I assume you realize by now that as of October 24th, the blues are where the friendly forces were, the reds are where the Japanese were at that stage. And, and of course, we're back here at Pearl Harbor and so forth, and the May and so on. So, they made the landing. Those marvelous scenes of General MacArthur going to shore and saying, I have returned to the Philippines. And uh, he had the President of the Philippines along with him, and great emotion in the Philippines. And they established that beachhead right away with very few casualties, very solid, took over the Tacloban airfield, began to land planes right there, uh, right away on the first day, and of course they had little carriers and so forth. Then began our reports coming in of the Japanese Navy on the move. We had a report from way down here by submarines of sighting a, some of the Japanese Navy coming up out of Singapore, others coming up out of Brunei and Borneo, and the submarines hit a few of them on their way. And then we had another report of a force 
coming down from Japan outside of Formosa. And these, was re these reports came in. We, of course, were setting up the disposition of the fleet and the forces. And then, as the reports continued, it became clear that quite a few of these were going to come in down here, try to come up at Lady this way. Admiral Oldendorf had six of our older battleships and a good force and a lot of PTs there, and they disposed of them along this long bay down in here, and then the, the old battleships were across the end of the Gulf, quite a few kilometers from the landings, but to bottle them up as they came through what was called Surigao <coughs> Strait. And as we followed that, in the meantime, this force came up, had the two big new battleships in it, the pride of the whole Japanese Navy, tremendous new powerful battleships. They were in this force, along with other cruisers and so forth, and they started up through what was called San Bernardino Strait up in here. We gave them a tremendous attack by air on the uh, 23rd and 24th of October. And uh, one of the big new battleships was definitely sunk, seen to roll over and sink, and after the war it's confirmed that that big new battleship went down right in San Bernardino Strait. And the pilots reported and had pictures of hits on a lot of the ships, and the, the force up here coming through reversed and started back out. And then I should fit in now that thinking in terms that we were going to go up the Philippines, we also knew that MacArthur's plan all the time was that he would come up and take over Mindoro. This is the island of Mindoro, just south of Manila. He would capture that island solidify it, put in airfields, and then go on to take over Manila and the rest of Luzon and the rest of the Philippines. We had been analyzing for a long time how we would give effective support for MacArthur coming up to Mindoro. It had been subject of intense study between all of us and with the Admiral, with Admiral Halsey, because we, of course, I might say, and this is also in the official records, we expected, anticipated, and planned for and overcame the whole kamikaze business before it was generally recognized in the headquarters and the Joint Chiefs that that was a thing that was done. And this was the way that came about. Admiral Halsey said very early, the way they'll come out of these caves like a Tarawa and just commit suicide in a kamikaze rush. So there's no reason why that will only happen in the Army who find that the Navy will do it too and their Air Force will do it too. It's a part of the whole mystique of their religion, the whole matter of their key to going to their heaven by dying in battle, and that we've got to plan that they will do that kind of a dive. And of course, in his first battle here, a plane dove into the Princeton, one of those kamikaze type uh, dives. We lost the Princeton and almost all the personnel on a Princeton carrier right in this early part of this battle. So that we felt that if they put their carriers halfway between Mindora and Cameron Bay, or halfway between Mindoro in Hainan, they had airfields both places, and they hop skipped their kamikaze planes, starting at the base, Cameron Bay, or Hainan, land on the carrier, refuel, and then come in on their one-way trip for our transports and our ships. No way could we over here, on this side of the Philippines, put an air cover over there and hold its place long enough to be able to give effective support against those kamikazes. And we 
analyzed what the dangers would be if we tried to take the fleet down through over on that side, and then we'd be between Luzon and Caron uh, Bay and so forth with the whole fleet. Of course, you get a ship damaged under those kind of circumstances. It's, it's awfully rough. And we were analyzing and analyzing. When, on this third day of this battle, you might say Doug Moulton, in the early two days as these sightings came in, was saying over and over again, where are their carriers? And we knew from following the whole thing from the beginning that they still had four carriers and two what we called half carriers or bastard carriers. They were half battleships and half carriers. And she said, we knew they had those six. None of them had been accounted for in any of these sightings. Finally, on the 24th, late in the day, we got a sighting up here in one of our searches. And then we got another sighting. And pretty soon we knew that they had their carriers up here, about 400 miles away from us, up on the northern edge of Luzon. They had come down from Japan. And that night, we had a tremendous conference in that flag plot. We had the whole thing plotted out, where all these forces were, and every kind of a answer. I'm leading up to this now because what I'm coming to now is one of the most controversial, criticized Navy decisions, perhaps in all of Navy history of our country. And you will find real distinguished historians, Admirals say Admiral Halsey made a terrible blunder, he made awful mistakes, so on and so forth, and over and over again different kind of analyses in any of the history books. He listened to everybody. That was his manner. Every one of the six of us with him in flag plot that night were joining in the analysis. We analyzed and we were pretty well unanimous that this southern force would be completely taken care of by the six battleships and the forces that were here with the landing. And then when we sunk one battleship and they told of all the destruction here and some turned back, the fleet turned back, said they might come back through, but if they do they're pretty much damaged. They've also had some submarine attacks. The most important thing and the future of the war was to get those carriers. And after about a solid hour of considering dividing the fleet, doing this, doing that, different kinds of attacks, Admiral put his finger down on our flight plot, up on our plot here, and said, we will run north at top speed and put those damn carriers down for keeps. And that was the order. From that moment, of course, the whole fleet began to move and the orders started to go out. And of course, here are part of the things that some of them say. Uh, and we, earlier, before we had successfully attacked these battleships, we had issued, the Admiral had issued a preparatory order. It said, when ordered to do so, form a battleship line four in the front, across San Bernardino Strait, and the carriers behind you, and that's the way we'll greet them when they come through. But when this force had been damaged and he sighted the carriers, then the talk, should you leave the battleships here and run the, the uh, carriers north? And it was then talked through and agreed. The only way we could be sure of sinking those carriers in the morning would be to run right up to where we knew they had been at top speed and to run at night with carriers at top speed to meet some battleships potentially. And if they had started to come down, that would be one of the most foolhardy things to do. Because of course carriers have real no defense if they get within range of the guns of battleships. So we formed the four battleships in the front. The carrier's divisions were ordered to 
pull in behind us and to take a fast run up to where those Jap carriers had been sighted. Admiral McCain and his particular task group were on their way back down here to Ulithi to refuel. They were then also given an order to postpone the refueling and come back down here to back up the San Bernardino Strait situation. Then, of course, as we ran north, the questions came up that indicated that a part of this force had come through San Bernardino Strait and it started down toward Lady Gulf. And they tangled with some of our little jeep carriers and some of their destroyers that were with them. They also were much farther north than we had known of the plan of where they were to be. And when that report began to come, naturally it was troubling. But by that time, of course, we were almost up to where the Jap carriers had been. And at daybreak, just before daybreak, we launched 360 degree search and then launched our attack planes to wait. And as the search went out, they located the flights, uh, located the carriers, and the attack began. By noon that day, every one of those carriers was on the bottom of the ocean, and the two semi-carrier, semi-battleships were so terribly damaged that they were limping back toward Japan. And then in the middle of this came these controversial orders saying, you know, where are your battleships? And of course, Halsey said, they're here. And well, they thought they were going to be down here at San Bernardino Strait. And uh, when they, that thing came up, then Halsey turned the fast battleships around to run back down toward San Bernardino Strait. Now, the key thing, of course, it also then became a, a great matter that still goes on. Of, was it a mistake to have Admiral Kincaid here under MacArthur's command and Admiral Halsey here under Nimitz's command, a divided command right in the middle of that terrific battle. And that's a whole group of arguments and questions. My point is, and my belief from that day on, is that getting those carriers was the most important thing to do that next day. And we got them. You can't get them if you stay a couple hundred miles away from them. Uh, which we know so well, if you're going to attack a carrier force, you've got to be close up so you can really hammer them to <coughs> knock them completely out. And of course, that's what was done with those carriers. And on the way back down then, and all the emotion of he being criticized, he got a message from Kaminsch in Washington saying, Explain your tactics, which of course is pretty tough language. <coughs> he sent this message back. The Japanese Navy has been destroyed and will take no more effective part in this war. That's the message he sent back. In a few hours back came this response. We do not see the basis for your conclusion. He sent back this message. Wait and see. <laughs> so that's the great story and all of its implications. And as I say, it's one of the most debated group of decisions and circumstances of the whole war. But even with knocking on all those carriers, they sending planes down to Luzon over ground and without the advantage of any carriers. <clears throat> One of the days trying to go up to Mindoro, in a single day, kamikazes hit 11 ships, and some of them were very seriously damaged. And of course, if, if they had had these carriers left and the plane <coughs> and were taken out here where we couldn't reach them, sending them on in in those kamikazes versus our transports, <coughs> I shudder to think of what kind of a ride it would have been to come up to Mindoro. But from that point on, 
kamikazes still put in a lot of damage. Because, of course, if you take one plane with bombs and you just dive it onto a ship straight out in the kamikaze, a suicide of the pilot, and especially if you hit the right place or you hit the ammunition on the ship, you set up a tremendous explosion and you can destroy a big carrier by one little plane coming down with that kamikaze dive. And that, I think, the more the historians will finally dig in, they'll find that we were calculating on what kamikazes meant long before they were recognized at headquarters, that we were planning that Mindoro had to be the way you'd go up to get to Manila and so forth, and that we did wipe out every one of the last Japanese carriers yeah. that morning. And, of course, some will say, well, half of our fleet could have gone up and, done, and did it. Well, from being there, I doubt it. Then out of that, another interesting thing happened, and you'll read this. The Japanese were building another big battleship up in their yards at that time. And they changed it to make that one big one a new big carrier because they were stripped with no carriers. And then, by the fact that they didn't have any carriers and they rushed that one, when they brought it out of Tokyo Bay and started it out toward the fleet, one of our submarines was sitting there and got that carrier, and that's been in the Reader's Digest story, at that carrier that they, when they want, got one built, that got sunk. And the other thing was that that other battleship that was damaged here and got back up to uh, their forces, their fleets, after long repairs, it finally sortied late in the war without any air cover, and we sunk it without it did ever getting a chance to shoot anybody. So that my contention is, and the reason in a way that I gave in after all these years to Don, is I believe that Admiral Halsey made one of the really great decisions that night when he said we'll run north at top speed and we'll put those carriers down for keeps. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.